everyone, good morning, good afternoon, and a very good evening to you! It's gonna be with a tube, hope we all today everything grand and always by your world! Uh, hello everybody, I welcome to another Q&A Wednesday, I hope you're good. Okay, so uh, let's dive straight in, as I have five questions to get through today, and I want to talk to you about something at the end. So, let's get on! Okay, so, uh, question one today, everybody, is how is the lead guitar tone for the Red Hot Chili Peppers song Dost achieved? Okay, so, um, Dost is a mishmash of bridge and neck pickup only. Um, the main guitar riff... That, 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 that thing and... I'm really not prepared for this because my guitar's not plugged in, but okay. Right, uh, but the main kind of guitar riff that everybody knows, I don't even have a plectrum. Is there a plectrum up here? There is a plectrum up here. That one, as I just played, you just played that day. Why are you playing it again? Anyway, uh, the main guitar riff is all on the neck pickup. So that's all neck pickup. And pr in all fairness, 85% of this song is neck pickup, okay? So uh, all the kind of like, you know, the chorus, you know, the chorus parts and uh, the, the kind of the main kind of picky guitar, I'm eating my own hair, uh, is all on the neck pickup. The uh, solo is like... Uh, and... And... Uh, get it right now, Dave, I'm not looking. Those bits are the bridge pickup. So predominantly, you want to be on the neck pickup for all the rhythm parts. For the lead part, it's just a bridge semicolon pickup. Um, not distorted, but not clean. It's that it's that usual John Fashanti kind of um, broken up, clean kind of tone that he has in Dost. It's not 100% clean. It's got a little bit of grit and dirt behind it, although it still sounds clean. So, uh, so that's what you'll be doing. For the so, so for the solo tone, it's uh, for the solo part, it's bridge pickup. For the rhythm part, it's neck. Um, I think mainly just because the bridge has got more cut. So, so yeah. So um, that was a really quick, quick. That was a really quick answer. But hopefully that made sense. Uh, and I hope that's answered your question. Okay. Um, yes. So, uh, so yeah. That's that. That's what it is. It's just a. It's just a bridge pickup on a strat. With that John Fashanti kind of broken up, cleanish kind of tone that I, I've got a million videos on. So, um, well, not a million videos. That's an over-exaggeration, isn't it, Dave? You've got a few. Yes, I have. But, um, anyway, uh, but yeah, so that's, that's how that is. It, it, but again, like I say, it's not super clean. Do not let your ears fool you into thinking John Fashanti's guitar tone is clean. It's not clean at all. There is a lot of grit behind it. It's just that the amps that John uses, when they're cranked, even though they're compressing and distorting or overdriving, I don't really distort, well, they kind of do, it's, it's more of an overdrive sound and a full-out distortion tone. But um, the, because they're overdriving, distorting, uh, it makes it appear clean when it's not, if that makes any sense. So, excuse me. I hope that's answered your question. Uh, I'm going to move on to question two now. Okay, so question two has one, two, three, four, five. Has six sub-questions. So, let's dive into question two. Splosh. Okay, so question two. Um, have you ever considered a wet dry rig or a wet dry wet rig for home use? Yes, I have considered it, but I don't want it. If that makes any sense, I like I like running things in stereo, but I don't like the idea of like one amp having delays and one amp not. I've tried it, and it does sound good, but it doesn't appeal to my ear. I don't like it. And the whole wet-dry-wet wet thing, I haven't, I haven't tried that, but I've tried the wet-dry rig, and I don't really like it. I like I like my effects to affect both amps at the same time. I don't like the idea of it just kind of going to one amp and not the other. So you've got delays going through, say, the left amp, or... So, for instance, like, the, the cell behind me, if I, if I had, like, delays going through the orange and the Marshall was clean, I, I wouldn't like that. I, I, I don't like that. I've tried it. So, um... I, I do love stereo. I love running amps in stereo. It's my dream to be able to use a stereo setup live. Sadly, the gigs I do and the places I do, it's not an option. It's just it's just not. I just don't have the ability to run the stereo. It's just 
I don't have the space most of the time and I, uh, volume restrictions. You know, I mean, when you run in stereo, both amps need, you don't, don't need to be cranked, but it sounds better if they are because you get more of a spread. So um, if I'm running quietly, it's kind of, it, that kind of gets lost and kind of goes away. So, um, so the whole wet dry thing, I have tried it, but I don't like it. It, it, it. Like I said, I like my effects to affect both amps at the same time, not one go. No, not, not going to one amp. It doesn't really appeal to me. So, um, so yeah, I have considered it and I have tried it, but it's not for me. I haven't tried a wet dry wet rig, but um, you know, I. I'm a bit of a creature of habit, which I'll get to a bit more in a bit. But yeah, like I said, I, I, I like the idea of like, if I've got a delay on, I would like it to affect both amps at the same time, not just one. It feels weird to me. When when I tried it and I only had delay coming out of one amp, it felt really wrong to me. If that makes any sense. I don't know if that makes any sense. But it just felt like, no, it, it felt it, it felt wrong. And I'm, a, I'm and because I'm, I'm because I go by everything is by feel with me. Like, I, I, if it doesn't feel right, I'm not going to do it. Um, that's really yeah, that was really important. So yeah, it, it just didn't work for me. But yeah, I, I know a lot of people it does work for, and that's that's really cool. But for me, it's a no no. I, I, I like stereo, I like mono, but I like using one amp. But um, yeah, I don't really like the wet dry wet dry thing or wet dry whatever. It just doesn't really appeal to me. Okay, so uh, you also asked. Uh, I noticed that you love all your gear. I do indeed. Uh, how do you manage to do that? Because a lot of players constantly change. Uh, yes, they do. Um, coming on from question, uh, well, part part one of question two. Yeah. Yeah. Um, simply, I'm a creature of habit. Uh, once I find something I like or love, I stick to it like glue. Hence... Marshall MGs, CR120, Boss Katanas, same pedals I've had for eight, nine, ten years now. Uh, I've had the Zoom for longer. I've had the Zoom. Well, I first got my Zoom, my, my Zoom 606. Second year I was playing guitar because I wanted a Wawa, uh, but that's a different story. We don't need to digress into that. And then I got the the, the G2.1 U as an upgrade about two years later, or a year. I don't know. I forget. I would have to think about that. But, but yeah, sim simply, I'm a creature of habit. Once I find something I like, I don't feel the need to stray. You know what I mean? Once I find a sound I like, I don't mess with it. Like, um, the settings I've got on my Marshall Governor that's on the floor down here haven't changed since I got the pedal. The first day I got the pedal, that's the setting I found, and I haven't touched it since. Same thing with Golden Plexi. Same thing with DST. I've always loved the DST maxed out. Uh, same thing with the um, the effects inside my Zoom. The same thing with the effects inside my Line 6 Delay modeler. The HX effects that I use for live, uh, I haven't changed. Once I got the sound I liked in the HX, I haven't touched it since. And if I do set up a new pedal board in the HX, a new preset, I just use the same presets and just alter the effects. You know what I mean? I'm a, I'm a total creature of habit, so... All my MGs pretty much are set up the exact same way, apart from this one, which is slightly different, because it's a newer one. This the the chassis inside the Blues Faker here is a 2007 MG, which is where they changed from the chrome grill fan to, to just basically an integrated uh, grill, which is actually in the chassis. And those ones sound a little bit different. They've got more gain and they're a little smidgen bit brighter. So what I normally do is run the map. Uh, I normally run mids on the MGs. On all my MGs, it's it's run at seven. Uh, on on my uh, on on the flexi that's uh, through there, and my number one MG that's in uh, through the other room, I have always run mids since I got that amp on seven. And um, the only thing I play around with is bass, and that's very rare. I normally have bass off or maxed out. Uh, normally when I'm recording videos, I have it off because it gets really boomy in this room because it's a small room. So I normally just turn the bass all the way down. But uh, the Blues Fake is slightly different. I have to turn the mids down because it's a little bit brighter on OD1. So I have the mids at 5 on this amp, which is, uh, again, I've had this, the chassis inside this in, inside the Blues Fake, I've had for ages. I bought it after I saw, uh, after I saw my Valve State 100 head. About a year later, I needed a backup amp. I didn't have a backup amp. The only one I had was Carl's bro, and um, I was carting that around to gigs, but it, I, I wanted to use my 412 cab, 
So I, I, I bought the other MG head, which is now the chassis is now inside the Blues Faker, um, to, to use as a backup. And then that replaced my number one because I was afraid of uh, somebody stealing my number one amp. No one's going to steal a Marshall MG, MG, Dave. But at the time, it felt real. It's the same reason I, I, I didn't gig Mr. White here because I'm terrified somebody will come along and just go, I'll have that. Uh, oh, it makes me go cold inside, I tells you. But yeah, um, well, I, I don't know what I was talking about. Oh, yes, MGs. But uh, I think I've digressed massively, but that's okay. That's okay. Tangents are good. Tangents are good. That should be a t-shirt. Tangents are good. Okay, um, by the way, t-shirts are coming. Okay, uh, I have two design, well, very basic designs, but um, I'll show you them soon, I promise. Uh, well, when they get here. But anyway, um, where was I? Yes, uh, yeah, I'm a creature of habit with setting. So the setting on that uh, on this MG hasn't changed, it's got it. I run the gain a bit lower as well on this. So for instance, like, because I said this has got more gain, I normally run gain between one and two. It's one, uh, sorry, it's two on my number one MG, and it's number it's and it's one on my um, flexi, and it's basically zero point five on the blues faker, uh, but so, simply because it's because it's a later model with a different uh, uh, fan where they change things slightly. They still have the same tonality, but this one's got more gain when you when you're straight in. Um, I turn the gain down a smidgen more to get it clean enough for me to be happy. So and get for, to get that kind of sound. So and it sounds. Just gorgeous. This 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 MG amp just sounds gorgeous. And to say in the Blues Faker, it's just even more gorgeous. And it's got MG speakers in it, by the way. If uh, uh, for for anybody wondering what speakers are in the Blues Faker, they're just uh, MG Celestians. Uh, I think uh, 70 watts. I don't know. Um, I could be totally wrong in that assumption. I don't know. I can't see them, uh, and they sound good. So again, and this is the thing. I don't care about the technical aspects of stuff. If it, if it, if it's set, obviously certain things like, you know, for instance, I can't plug the CR120 into a four ohm cab. Stuff like that, I am wary about. And also kind of like, you know, when I had my small box Plexi, uh, I was very well aware of switching the ohmage thing, you know, all the time and, and make sure the ohms match so I get the most out of it. And same thing with the, the MG and the CR120. Got that the wrong way around, didn't I? And uh, I'm very aware of stuff like that. And also, um, you know, just you know, just general health and safety stuff so it won't blow your amp up and stuff like that, you know. Um, so yeah, I'm just a creature of habit. Once I find something I like, I stick to it like glue and it takes a lot for me to, to change, really. It's like, wait, nothing makes me change. Just certain things will come along that I'll start using more. Like for instance, the Katana. Um, the Katana 100, I mean, the Katana 50 was my main amp this in, in pretty much entirely last year. And I still love that, and that's my backup now. Uh, but my main amp live is the Katana 100, which I absolutely adore. And um, mainly because I can turn the presence off, which I can't do on that because I don't have access to this tone studio yet. Um, but yeah, I'm just a creature of habit. Once I find things I like, I don't change. I don't feel the need to change. I will play around with other things. But it takes a lot for me to go, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get rid of this pedal, now I'm going to get this one, I'm going to change these pickups and do that. It's like, I don't feel the need. It was like, it's like when I, when I bought this guitar, it felt right straight from the get-go. And um, I've never changed anything on it. I mean, the only thing that got changed on it was the saddle that that um, overzealous Luffy had decided to change out. But thanks to Nick Oswald, I have a replacement now, a proper replacement that actually matches but I haven't changed anything. I don't feel the need to change machine heads, pickups. The pickup height is the same since... I, the pickup height that I've got is the height this guitar came with. Um, it's not Fender spec, I don't think. But they're very low. Well, they're quite high on the treble side, but quite low on the bass side. So maybe it is Fender spec, I don't know. But other than that, I haven't changed anything. Unless something breaks, like the jack socket broke about a year and a half ago. And I had to replace the jack socket on this. But other than that... I don't feel the need to mess with it. And it's the same thing with uh, all my other guitars. The only time I mess with it is something breaks. So the lemon drop, I changed the wiring on the lemon drop when the pots broke. Uh, after about a year and a half of, of playing the lemon drop, the, the original pots died uh, and I had to change it. And I thought it'd be a cool time to actually change to a wiring that I kind of like maybe would prefer on a, on a, on a single chord guitar like that. Anyway, um, 
Oh yes, and I've restored the lemon drop to back to its Peter Green goodness, everybody. So uh, that's why it's hung on the wall behind me looking like it does. So I've put the covers back on, put the pickup back, back right around, took the scratch plate off and put the, uh, not the original dial uh, knob covers back on, but uh, yeah, kind of the correct ones that it would have been when uh, Peter owned that guitar. So I thought it'd be really cool because I'm playing the Revelation a lot more than I am Mr. Lemon Drop. He, he's not retired by any stretch of your imagination. I will still use the Lemon Drop a lot. Just as not as much as the Revelation, as I love it a lot more, as you heard in the beginning. It really speaks to me, that guitar. Really, really speaks to me. Go away, weird fluff thing. Go away, fluff. But yeah, um, I digress. But yes, uh, it's basically I'm a creature of habit. I don't feel the need to change things once I get it. The only thing I have changed uh, on my newest thing. So thank you Revelation for the gift of this guitar. Uh, some people have been saying I should get given this guitar which I don't feel worthy of in any shape or form but thank you very much and Revelation have very kindly given me this guitar. So thank you so much Revelation. I think I've already said that in the video. If I haven't I'm an idiot and that's all there is to it Dave. You're an idiot. But one thing I have changed on this is I've put reflector knobs on who were madam. Uh, simply because they're taller and I can get to them easier and I like these ones a lot more than these style. These are my favourite style next to the big speed... I think they're called speed knobs. There's these massive gold ones that are really, really cool. Uh, but other than that, if I have like a preference thing, if you will, that's kind of, that's about it. I don't I don't feel the need to change pickups and stuff like that. And I don't feel the need to change amps. I'm very happy where I am. I'm just very content. And I say, that comes from being a creature of habit. Once something works for me, I don't change. I I really don't change. Once, once I've found something that I love and works and I'm happy with, that's what I'm using. And uh, that's, yeah, that, that's what it is. I like consistency as well, which is no reason why I prefer solid state to valve amplifiers is I like consistency of sound. So when I go to an amp, I like to turn it on and know exactly how it's going to sound. Uh, no ifs, no buts. And uh, Solid State has always done that for me. And, and that was one thing that made me fall out so much with my small box Plexi and my JCM800 when I had that for a while. Um, was some days it would sound good, some days it would sound bad, depending on what the power was that day. And it was kind of annoying after a while. So, and I like, because I like consistency, uh, that's, that's, that's what worked for me. So yeah, I'm just a creature of habit. Um, I don't feel the need to change things to try new things. If, if something's good, it's good. And again, it comes down to that thing of if it feels right, that's all that matters. Uh, if it feels wrong, I won't, you know, I might tweak, but very rarely. I'm not really a tweaking kind of person. I like, like I said, I like once things are set, that's it. I don't really, I don't feel the need to change it or anything like that. It's like, it's like when, when I do a gig, I, I will not go near my amp unless I need to change the volume. I don't change EQ, I never have. Like, you know, once EQ's dialed into what I have it on an MG or the CR120 or the Katana, uh, I don't touch it again. You know, the only time I'll go near my amp is if the, vo if the volume's too quiet or too loud. And um, that's it, that's the only thing I'll change. So yeah, it's just creature of habit. I am just a creature of habit. I keep saying that. Say it one more time, Dave, for the good luck. I am a creature of habit. Anyway, so yeah, uh, moving on. Uh, next thing you asked was, uh, what do you think? Is it better to save up and buy something really pricey and high quality, or do you get something affordable? Uh, it's up to you. Um, in all fairness, that's a question. That, that's a, that's the answer to that question is only something that you can answer. It comes down to what you want, and this is the question you always have to ask yourself. In, in oddly enough, not just music gear or in, in life. And I'm going to get really zen on you and philosophical now. But this is really important. In life, you need to ask yourself constantly what you want. If you're feeling dissatisfied with whatever's going on, you need to ask yourself, what do you want? What are you not doing that you want to do? And how could you make that happen? You know what I mean? Um, you know, it, it just comes down to that. It, it, it's, not, it's not up for me to... It's not really up for me to say, oh, yeah, you should save up and get a Gibson. Or no, you should go out and buy uh, this, that, and the other. It's it's really down to you. It's your decision at the end of the day. It's not my decision to make. If you want the Gibson name, then yeah. You know, if you literally just can't, you know, you can't sell. It has to be a Gibson. Then go and get a Gibson. 
if if you're quite happy to kind of like you know go, I don't really care what it says on it as long as it's you know uh, you know as long as it, I as long as I'm happy with the guitar, it sounds the way I want it to, it plays the way I want it to, and it looks a certain way I want it to, then I'm happy. Uh, sound being sound and playability being the most important parts. Looks is always last, I think, to me. Um, if it sounds right and it plays right, then looks. I can get by with a guitar not looking 100% the way I wanted to. As long as it sounds and plays well, I couldn't give a monkey's... Um, if you know what I mean. So, uh, so yeah. Um, but, yeah, is it is it save up, buy something really expensive? It's totally up to you. I mean, you, you did say it was kind of like, you know, talk, thinking about, like, long-term and resale value. But the fact of the matter is, if you're buying something because you love it, the whole resale, resale value and kind of like will it gain money in the future shouldn't really come into it. I mean, this guitar to me is absolutely priceless. But to somebody else, this is just a Mexican Strat. 60s reissue Mexican Strat, you know, that's worth in the region of about 300, 400 quid. But to me, this is priceless. You know, I mean, I, I when I bought this guitar, I wasn't thinking about resale. Um, I wasn't thinking about like how much is it going to, cost in years to come or anything like that. I don't think that way and I, I don't care because I love the guitar too much to care and it'll never leave me. You know, it'll never leave me. You couldn't pry this out of my cold, dead hands. You know, I miss, this guitar is coming with me to the grave, full stop. You know, <laughs> it's as simple as that. This guitar comes with me because it's quite a selfish thing, I know, but this is... If I wasn't human, this is what I would look like. <laughs> it sounds really silly to say, but serious on a serious note, this is this is this is my best friend. Out of all the guitars I own, sorry guitars, but I have I the bond I have with this instrument is beyond anything. And it's really hard to explain and, and it's it, people think it's being people think you're being really silly and Kind of over dramatic or just being dead cliche and stuff, but I'm not. It's like you know, and and I'm sure all of us out, uh, a lot of you out there have an instrument that you feel the same way about. It's like literally, if it if it disappeared, you know, you'd be at loose end. You'd be like, what do I do? You know, and, it, and it's not about resale value because, like I say, I'm not thinking about selling it. I'm not buying it. I'm not. I didn't buy this guitar to go. Well, in a couple of years' time, it, I'm, it's not an investment. This guitar isn't an investment. That's what I'm. That's what I'm trying to say. None of my guitars are investments. Not even no. Not even the 62 Strat is an investment. It's a guitar that I want to play and enjoy, and I want others to play and to enjoy. They're not investments to me. They're guitars that I love. You know what I mean? I don't own a single guitar that I hate because I don't see the point. I've got to love the guitar to own it. You know, I've really got to love it. Which is why I'm a bit surprised by the revelation in a way. I absolutely adore that revelation, Les Paul. I really do. Because there is just something in it that just spoke to me. And I really, really thought it would have been the 55 that I bonded with. Because I love Black Les Paul Customs with P90s. I, it's my, one of my favourite looking and favourite uh, kind of like you know, single cut Les Paul style guitars. But the connection I got immediately with that revelation is, is, is weird. And you know, you know it when you know it, kind of thing. It's one of those things that you feel. But yeah, so um, it's up to you, really. If you want to go out and buy a guitar that you want for an event, I, ideally, I would. I, I have played with the idea of buying a Gibson for investment purposes. I, I used to own a '57 Gold Top, and I bought that for that idea of I'm not. I'm going to play it, but I'm going to look after it and. Down the line, it'll be my kind of like rainy day guitar that if I have to sell, I'll sell just so I can keep the others. Um, and I have played with the idea since. I would, in all fairness, I would like to buy. I can't afford it, and you know that's the, the, it's, it's the way it is. But I would like to buy something like that as an investment because it, it is a nice kind of investment. But that's not. But then I feel like it's it's, it's not genuine. You know what I mean? You, you're buying it for the sole purpose of one day you're gonna sell it. You're not buying it to enjoy it. It's like, I remember when I was working in old hat guitars, there was a guy who, um, who came in, he bought John Entwistle's 1962 Fender Strat. It was Fiesta Red, pristine. It was absolutely pristine. In all fairness, it wasn't actually a great 62, which is a bit weird considering it was John Entwistle's. I don't know. It might, it might have just because it was set up for him. 
But I, I really liked the guitar, but it was it was tough to play. It felt like it had never been... Because it was so pristine, it, it it's like what Eric Clapton said about Maple Neck Stratocasters. If a Maple Neck Strat has tons of finger wear on the fretboard, it must be a great guitar because somebody's put a lot of hours. If that Maple Neck's pristine, it means it's maybe not a great guitar because no one's really wanted to play it. And that, that's the way I felt about John Entwistle's guitar, 62 Strat, was... It was a gorgeous guitar, it was pristine, original Fiesta Red finish, original Selma Croc skin case with strap lead, you know, everything was original on that thing. It was, you know, it was Giant Whistle, you know, um, prolific guitar, guitar collector. And it was in his book and everything, and it was just a gorgeous example of a Fiesta Red Stratocaster from Sierra. It hadn't, it hadn't pinked either, the guitar hadn't gone salmon pink. It was, it was red, it was proper Fiesta Red. And... But it wasn't a great guitar because it hadn't been played. It hadn't been loved. It was just in his collection. It, what You could tell it wasn't a guitar that he went to on, you know, when he wanted to play. It, it was one of those guitars he had because, and it even says in John Entwistle's book, which I forget the name of, next to the picture of the Fiesta Red Strat, I wish it had, I wish I had got one with a maple neck, which means he didn't even want it in the first place. He just, you know, he, he bought it because. Almost, you know, it was it was one of those guitars, and it just it felt unloved. It really felt unloved. Whereas the '64 Fender Strat that came in just before I left Old Hat, which sadly got refinished in orange, which was supposed to be Fiesta Red, but went wrong. Uh, that guitar was stunning. That '64 Strat, it was original, and one owner, and the fretboard was almost scalloped. It was such... It played itself. It was one of those guitars that just played itself. You know, it really was. And I was like, that's that's what a vintage Strat should feel like. And the 62 Strat um, that, you know, you, you you awesome people helped me get. And uh, we've nearly paid it off. Hey! <laughs> um, that guitar had the same thing. As soon as I played it, as soon as I borrowed it, that intro jam I did with it, I was like... This feels funny in a good way, in that kind of like, I can, I've connected with this instrument on a very, very higher level, which is um, very rare. You know, it doesn't happen all the time. It's, it's not often. I haven't, I didn't, as much as I love a Lemon Drop, and I'm not going to speak bad about a Lemon Drop because a Lemon Drop is a gorgeous guitar. The connection I have to Revelation is stronger than the connection I have to that. And I don't know why. I'm, it's not my... It's not my place to know why. It's just a fact of you feel it. The the revelation speaks to me on a higher level than the the lemon drop does. Even though the lemon drop speaks to me on a very high level as well, the revelation speaks even higher. The highest guitar I've got that speaks to me is this one. You know, it just if all my guitars had to go, that would be the only one that stayed. You know, that it, it's it's one of those. It, it, it's really strange. But yeah, I've digressed massively here. But like I say, the whole idea of like, you know, buying a guitar for, you know, just because it's expensive, I don't think it's important because like I say, I would put my Revelation or my Lemon Drop up against any Gibson and I'd be, and I have, uh, my friend has a, a, a Men Memphis, are they a Memphis Les Paul? The hollow bodied Les Paul? It's like an ES Les Paul, it's weird. And I have tried other Les Pauls, Gibsons, and I still would always come back to the Lemon Drop or my Revelation. You know, he said they're just they're, them two are my Les Pauls now. That's it. You know, if I want a humbucker Les Paul thing, you know, I'm gonna go for the Revelation. And if I can't get all the Revelation, I'll go for the Lemon Drop. You know, it's one of those things. And they both have two di distinct, different sounds, which I love. They both got two different voices, which is just gorgeous to me because I find the Lemon Drop more mellow and like you know, it's it's a deeper, warmer tone. Whereas I like, whereas the Revelation, which I like more, has more of that aggressive. Um, Peter Greeny, Jimmy Pagey kind of like snarl. You know what I mean? I, I don't know what it is about it, but I, I, I really, really, I really love it. So, you know, it's up to you. It's what do you want? Do you want to buy a Gibson? Or will you, are you happy with buying whatever? You know what I mean? It's up to you. That is, your, that is the, the only third person who can answer that really is you. And that's a proper terrible answer, Dave. But yeah, I've long-winded that one. But yeah, it's, you know, I love affordable gear because, you know, I just I just do. I love it. And, and also the fact is, if I do, 
accidentally turn and I dent the guitar, I'm not going to go, I've just dented a six grand guitar, you know what I mean? It's like, you know, it's one of those things. But the thing is, I don't think you should ever really think about guitars that you love from, unless you're a guitar dealer, you know, you should never really, if you're a player, you should never think about guitars from a retail or resale kind of thing. Because like, uh, Malcolm, who originally, it was the original owner of the 62 Strat, that was originally Fiesta Red, which is, uh, you know, classed as, you know, a very rare colour, a uh, custom colour from the Fender shop. So, original Fiesta Red Fender Stratocaster fetches a lot of money. And if it was original Fiesta Red, I wouldn't be able to own it. Simple as that. You know, it'd be worth thousands, thousands, thousands of pounds more than I could ever afford. But when Malcolm got that guitar refinished, he wasn't thinking about resale value down the line. You know, he was thinking, I don't like the Fiesta Red, I never have. So when when his mate offered to refinish it for him in black, he was like, yeah, and he loved it. You know, and he loved it more because it was a, a, a more a colour he wanted. You know, but he wasn't thinking down the line, no, no, I bet I'll get it refinished because in 50 years, you know, 50, 40 years time, it'll be worth X amount. You know, it's one of those things. And it's the same thing with anything, really. You know, I don't, if, if, it, if you love something, it doesn't matter about what it's worth. Because to you, it should be priceless. You know what I mean? It's like, if I lost that revelation, Les Paul, because it would terrify me. Because I'd be like, what if I buy another one and it's not the same? Because all guitars are different. Even if they're mass produced, they're all different. And I'd be like, what if it's not the same? Same thing with Lemon Drop, and especially with that one. You know, it's like, you know, what happens if I get another one? It's, it doesn't feel the same. What if I don't connect with it? You know, because that has happened. Um, you know, it's, it's it's a weird thing. But anyway, saving up to buy something pricey and high quality against something affordable is is something you have to ask yourself. Like I say, it comes down to like, you know, what do you want? And I've rambled on enough. I'm going to have to move on because I've still got things to talk about and I've spoke for way too long. Okay, so I'm going to move on, sorry. Um, so I've answered that bit. Uh, you also asked, uh, do you get to comply with your neighbours about your guitar noises? Um, most of the time when I do videos, my neighbours aren't in, they're at work. So uh, most of the time I don't, uh, feel like I'm annoying them, but I am very, very aware of volume. I don't play very, very loud. I play about 80 dB. That's about as high as it gets. It's somewhere between 78 and 80 going by my dB, my decibel reader that I've got. You know, I, I put it on the other side of the room and it's somewhere between 78 and 80 dB, depending on the dynamic of the... When, when it's really loud, it's about 80, 81. When it's kind of like, you know, mellow, it's about 78. So I don't play super, super loud. Um, but I have the best neighbours in the world. They are the best neighbours in the world, and I couldn't ask for better people next door. So, um, so yeah, yeah. Um, so, okay, uh, you also asked, uh, do you think guitar can get you out of feeling down or depressed? Yes. Yes, definitely. But more, more than guitar, more than the guitar, it's music that gets you out of it. Yes, the guitar facilitates music, and it does help you, and it's, this one especially has helped me out of the pits of hell. And that's no word of a lie. Like, it really is true. Um, but it's what the guitar makes, which is music, that helps you more than anything. How often have you been feeling down and you've put your favourite band on, your favourite artist, and all of a sudden you start to feel better? You know, it's simply because music is our gift to make us feel better from some higher power. You know what I mean? You know, um, you know it's something we're not supposed to understand, but it's there and... Thank gravy it is. That's all I can say. You know, but, but yeah, it can. Because the guitar makes music and music makes you feel better. You know, it really does. Music is everything. Without music, what's the point? <laughs> In my opinion, you know, music really is... Everybody loves music, regardless of style. You know, regardless of genre or anything like that. You know, everybody loves something about music and that, that's awesome. So yeah, um... The final thing you asked is, if you could own one guitar and one amp, what would you pick? Aha. Okay, so one guitar, obviously, as I've been ranting and raving and and, and, and being generally obnoxious and talky, uh, my one guitar is this guitar. This is this is my this is my mate. That I get I get a bit most I, I I get a bit funny talking about it because it really is. 
we've been through some hard times, me and this guitar. We've been through some very, very, very hard times. And when I didn't want to go on, this did, and it made me. You know what I mean? And um, I love it. I really do. Like I say, this is my one guitar. If I could have one guitar, but oh, somebody came in and pointed a gun to my head and said, right, I'm taking all your guitars, you can only pick one, it'd be this one. You know, and like I say, to some people, it'd be a, it's a it's a 60s reissue Mexican Strat that's maybe worth about 300, 400 quid. To me, this has no price. You couldn't put a price on this. If somebody came to me and says, oh, I'll give you a million pounds for that guitar, it's like, I'm sorry, mate, you're going home with your million pounds. And, I, and that's no word of a lie, because it, it's, it's a bond that's beyond anything and i value this more because this is worth more than that even if i was homeless and living in a bin this guitar is worth more you know than you know somebody giving me whatever and i've got a bond with it i mean fair enough like the whole million pound thing is a bit of a, like you know exaggeration no one's going to do that and you know but hopefully that gets the point across because I, I don't know it's really hard to explain. It comes across as silly, and I totally understand that, and I can I can totally understand why people would think that's a really stupid thing to say, Dave, and I totally, totally understand. But it really is something else. This is like what Rory's 61 was to him, and Steve Ray Vaughan's number one strap was to him, and, and Jimi Hendrix's 68 black strap was to him, and countless others. You know, Peter Green's Les Paul, what it was to him, and Gary Moore's Stripe, what it was to him, and stuff like that, and... Eric Clapton's Blackie, you know, but they, these guitars have, there's something else, they're not just a guitar at that point, they are, they are a part of you, they're not just a guitar, they're not just a piece of wood with wires and electrics, you know, they are something else, and uh, that one especially is, is my number one, but you, it'll always be, it's the guitar that I cross-reference everything to, if it doesn't stand up to that, then I don't want it, <laughs> it's as simple as that, um, and if something sounds weird, I always go for that guitar. And if it sounds good on that guitar, then it's the guitar that I'm playing or it's the pedal I'm playing or whatever. You know, I can always find my way with that guitar. It's like Bernie Marsden and, and the Beast. Bernie Marsden said in an interview with Anderton's, he said, as long as he's got the Beast, he knows what he can do with any amp. Give him any amp, he knows what he can, he knows he can get a sound out of it as long as he's got the Beast. And that's my, that's my Beast. That's mine. That's my, that's my Greenie. That's my battered Rory Gallagher strat that's my 1962 Fender strat John Frusciante thing that, that's my guitar you know what I mean so um so yeah um and the amp I would pick if I had if I had to pick one amp it would have to be the MG just because I always go back to it as much as I love the CR as much as I love the Boss Katana I always come back to the MG it's my home it's the first amp I got that gave me that sound that I love you know what I mean? I had Carlsberg before and I had the PV Rage before that and then I got my MG, which is in the other room. And once I got that, my life changed. You know, tone all of a sudden was there that I wanted. So the one amp, one guitar that I would have is my white strap, Mexican strap, and the Marshall MG, and that'd be me happy. I would be very happy with that setup and I am very happy with that setup. I can plug into that with that guitar and play all day long and not, not get bored, not get bored once. Uh, so, people of a tube, if you could have one guitar and one amp, what would it be? Let us know in the comment section below. Okay, I'm going to have to move on because I've got a lot of things to do and I've still got another three questions to go. Okay, so question three. I'm going to have to start going. Uh, could you share your crunch tone settings that you use on a katana? Yeah, well, my full out distortion tone is uh, the brown sound. I go to the brown setting. I have gain all the way up, volume all the way up, bass at 12 o'clock. Middle and treble all the way off. And I have reverb at a quarter on the green mode. Uh, reverb, so reverb's at nine o'clock. And then I have, well, then that's it. So that's my main lead tone. And that's what I use predominantly if I'm plugging into a guitar. I just basically ride the volume control. If I want it clean out, I just roll the volume down. Uh, if I want it more distorted, I roll the volume up. Uh, on the 100, I have presence off as well. On the 50, obviously, you can't do that unless you've got a tone studio. But I have presence off. So um, that's it. So just to recap, it's the brown mode, gain all the way up, volume all the way up, bass at 12 o'clock, middle, treble, presence, all on zero, reverb on the green mode at 9 o'clock, and that's it. 
and invariably I'll switch in kind of effects like delay and whatnot. So uh, so yeah, that that's that set. That's that. But I will do more videos soon showing you some of the sounds that I get on the katana very soon. I'll get to that. Okay. So I hope it's answered your question. Sorry, I'm going to have to motor a bit because uh, I've still got things to talk about and I'm running out of time. Okay, so question four. Uh, question four is, I have a classic vibe 60s Squire Strat. I love the tone, but hate the soft frets and soft pop metal hardware. I've been thinking of getting a vintage 60s-like Stratocaster on a budget. Uh, could you list some vintage style strats with a Strat headstock in order of vintageness? from your point of view. I mean, how good, like for instance, how good are Road Warns, the Avri Strats, as I call them, the A-V-R-I the -A Strats, Mexican Reissues, Classics. Okay, so to me, there's not a single 60s reissue Strat that's an exact replica of a 60s, 60s Strat. There isn't. Um, not even my white Mexican here is anything like an original, a real one. There just isn't. And I have never tried a reissue that actually is like a proper classic Strat. The best one I have tried is my Mexican reissue. This one here, which is, I think it was called like a classic. I don't know. Uh, it's a 2002 Mexican reissue. And I, I think these... Are amazing. I did own a road worn. I had I, I had a two thousand and eight road worn that now lives in Ireland, um, and I, I, I turned that into my John Fashanti Mark One Strat. But um, and that was a great guitar, and it still is a great guitar. And um, I I know the guy who owns it, so it's really cool. Uh, but my favorite, yeah, the, the one that sounds the closest to me is this one is my Mexican Strat. For some reason, the, these Tex-Mex pickups just sound the closest to me to an original Strat. And uh, I mean, the neck's nothing like an original Strat. The headstock isn't as thin. The um, the thickness of the body isn't the same. But it sounds identical, near enough, to an original 60s Strat, this one does. So that, that you know, and it, 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 looks, it looks right. You know, and that's all that matters. <laughs> no, it's not all that matters, Dave. What are you on about? I think I, I think I was talking kind of a bit weirdly there, but yeah, it does sound. Yeah, you because know, it sounds sounds right, and it looks like a, a '60s. You know, that that's kind of like you know that that it looks like a vintage strat. You know what I mean? But I think that's what I was going for. That is what I was going for. It's one of those days. Bear with me. But yeah, I mean, Road Warns are good. Road Warns are great guitars. I've got to say, and um, although I don't like the finger wear on the, on the maple neck one, it looks a bit stupid. But um, I mean, what guitarist doesn't play the 12th fret? Anyway, uh, but yeah, I mean, the, the one I found that gets closest sound wise uh, and look wise is the there's the Mexican uh, reissues, which I think are called classics. I don't, I really don't know. But um, but these these early 2000. Mexican reissues are absolutely fantastic. I had two. I had a red one, which I wouldn't wish I hadn't sold, but I had to sell because. Um, but yeah, they're amazing. So you know that that that'd be what I'd go for. And I say they have the Strat headstock. They're, they're a Strat, you know. I mean, they're they're through and through. I mean, but if you have to one with a Fender logo on it, and it has to have the sixties. Yeah, you know, it has to have the sixties small headstock. Then you know I, I would. I would go for something like a Road Worn or, or 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 a Mexican reissue. I mean, the Avery Strats, the AVRI AVRI Strats are really good as well. I have I've tried a lot of them. I've tried um, I've tried a fair few, and they probably get closer neck wise to a sixty a real sixty Strat, but they don't sound right. So they kind of feel more the necks the bigger 60s kind of profile, but they, they don't sound right. It's weird. Whereas the Mexican strats sound right, but don't have the neck. They don't have a big fat neck. Um, so yeah, I mean, what I would say is just basically just like go and just try as many as you can. If you, if you can try as many as you can, that's number one. Trying before you buy it, before you buy it is so important. It really is. I mean, but sometimes, you know, happy accidents happen. The revelation, for instance, that was a, you know, that was that was just sent to me. You know, I I I didn't try it before I picked it up, but as soon as I picked it up, I was like, ah, I need it. And um, 
you know, it's one of those things. But like I say, um, trying before you buy is important, but not always the way to go. But uh, I keep getting a blurry eye. My, my right eye keeps going all blurry. I think I've got something in it. It doesn't feel like it, but I keep going like blurry in the corner of my eye. Stop talking about your eye, Dave. Anyway, uh, but yeah, if you're after that kind of like classic 60s look and sound, you know, you, you can't really go wrong with the Mexican reissues. Road worn or just reissues in general. But like I said, the early 2000 reissues are amazing. This one is 2002, my mate. Uh, it's from 2002, April 2002. And really cool thing is, I started playing guitar in May of 2002. So this guitar was put together, well, not maybe even put together, but made, definitely, because all, the, all the, uh, the dates are the same, was made a month before I started playing guitar properly, which is awesome, which... I think that's fate, people of the tube. I think that's fate that this guitar ended up with me, considering it was made in 2002, April, and I started playing guitar in 2002 in May. Um, and it's my 17th year playing guitar in May this year. I've been playing guitar 17 years in, in May this year, which is really, really cool. Crazy. That means that guitar's 17 years old. <laughs> okay, moving along. Um... Yeah, that's, it's up to you, really. But like I said, I would recommend a Roadborne or a Mexican Classic. Uh, I reckon they're great. Okay, so um, final question of the day, everybody, because I really need to talk about something at the end, and I'm running out of time, is uh, where should I start when Where should I start when learning theory? Uh, okay, with, I always say this, but it's very important. Five positions of the pentatonic scales. I have a video on it somewhere, I think. I'm pretty sure I do. Um, if I do, which I think I do, I don't know, but I'm... I'm, I'm second guessing myself now, but I think I do. I will put the link for the video uh, below your question in the description box below. Um, but yeah, five positions of pentatonic scale if you want to learn, start learning theory. And then also learning relative major and minor is really important. So five positions of pentatonic scales, uh, relative major and minor, start to learn kind of like, you know, um, stuff like that. That's where I would start. That's, yeah, that's, that's where I started. I started learning kind of like, you know, the pentatonic scales, the major and the minor, and the five positions. Uh, you know, the blues scale uh, with the blue note, the flat five. Uh, start learning the neck of the guitar with the five position of the pentatonic scale, and also learning your relative major and your relative minor. Forget modes, forget all that. Just focus on pentatonics and relative major and minor and just start to kind of delve into kind of like learning guitar solos and also start to use your ears um, to learn things. It's really, really important to develop your he your ears, your hears. Well, kind of, they kind of are hears. You know, you can't spell hears without the word ears. I've gone mad. Anyway, um, that's, that's the quote of the day. You can't spe spell hears without the word ears. Anyway, yes, um, but yeah, that's where I would start. That's what I would recommend. Five percent pentatonic scale. Learn relative what relative major and minor is because that will help you learn kind of like to go that way. And then also kind of like learning chord theory, like you know what makes a chord, like you know what why is it that when you flatten the third does it become a minor? Why is you know what well, you don't need to know why. It just that's the way it is. Um, you know, if you flatten the third, it becomes a minor. If you, sh you know, if you sharpen the third from a from from a flat, it's uh, it's a major. You know that kind of thing. That, that dictates what the chord is going to be. The third, not the first, or the, not 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 the one or the five. It's the third, and then you can start learning kind of like harmony from that kind of thing. So major thirds and minor thirds and fourths and fifths and stuff like that. But I would start in with stuff like. Your five position pentatonic scale, which is so, so important, especially position one and position two, major and minor pentatonic, really, really important. And then obviously learning your relative major and minor. And then move on to stuff like intervals. Uh, intervals are quite really cool to play around with. Okay, so uh, people with a tube, uh, do you have any uh, chime? Feel free to chime in on that question as well. Um, you know, where, 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 where do you think this uh, person should start learning theory? So, uh, so yeah. Okay, so now moving on. So I hope that question's okay, everybody. I really hope that's uh, I hope, you know I haven't waffled on too much. I've said some stupid things because I'm an idiot, and that's the, what I do. But um, I hope some of it has made sense. Okay, so now it comes to an interesting thing that I've wanted to do for ages, and we're here finally, and it's going to be released tomorrow. Intro jam of today's video. I recorded me recording. 
I filmed me recording the uh, backing that I used today. And what I'm going to start doing uh, is basically releasing that video as a backing track for you. For something to play along with. So basically, I'm your rhythm guitarist. So you can play along the top, play over the top of the intro jam that you heard. The intro jam you heard at the beginning of this video will be released tomorrow as a backing track video. So you can see what I'm doing. And I will put the chords progression in the description box of the video so you know what chord it is. It's in D minor, everybody. Uh, so D minor pentatonic scale will work over this and it should you know, give you a thing. It's all in D minor. That's all I used was the five positions of the pentatonic scale coming out of D minor. So you can use D minor and F major and so on and so forth. Um, so I'm going to start doing that. I'm going to start releasing. I'm going to start filming me doing intro jams without lead. So just me recording the, you know, the chords that I, I make up, uh, the chord progressions that I make up and then releasing them without a lead on the top, just to, just as a video. So basically, I'm going to be your rhythm guitarist, and I want you to go crazy over the top soloing. So, say, for instance, today, it was kind of like, you know, there was a lot of kind of like, you know, it was kind of quite loud, and then it went really quiet, and then it went super loud at the end. So there's a lot of dynamic in there for you to play along with. And, uh, you know, just get a feel of where it's going. So, um... So yeah, so tomorrow I'm going to release that uh, the intro jam that I did today for a backing track for you. So basically just put it on. The chord progression will be in the description box and just basically go nuts over it. So uh, and I'm just going to try it. I'm going to see if this works uh, because I wanted to do backing tracks. Sitting on a Marshall MG head is really uncomfortable. Uh, I wanted to do backing tracks for a long time. So I thought I would do it this way so you get to play along with the intro jams. So if there's an intro jam you really, really like, you now get to play along with it. So, 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 so to say. And uh, hopefully my intro jam today will give you some ideas of what you can do and where you can kind of take it. Um, but it's best to just turn your brain off and just and just go for it and just feel what it's doing. So um, so yeah, that'll be out tomorrow. So it's, it's like the first backing track. Um, yeah, it is the first, yes, yeah, first ever backing track I'm going to release. And like I say, it's just going to be a video of me playing rhythm, basically. I, I thought I would just film me playing rhythm. I think it'd be a lot, you know, instead of just putting a picture of a guitar up or, or something like that, I thought if if you can see what chords I'm playing, it might help you along a bit. So uh, that, I'm going to start just like filming me doing the basic rhythm track to my intro jam. So And then kind of like, you know, upload it maybe the day after. So you uh, can uh, and uh, go and play along with it. And what I will do is I will I, I won't it won't be up tomorrow, but I'll probably get it done over the weekend because I don't have time at this point in time. But over the weekend, the backing track will be up on my Bandcamp as well, uh, which I'll put the link for on Monday's video, um, and and remind uh, and, and talk about it on Monday's video. Uh, so you can go and you can download it as well. So if you wanted to kind of like you know, go out, like take it somewhere else, so. You, if you're not near YouTube, if you want to burn it onto a CD, if anybody has, does that anymore, um, um, you know, you can then download it off my Bandcamp um, from there, and then you can take it with you wherever you go, kind of thing. So let me know, people of YouTube, uh, if you like that idea. And like I said, I will upload that video tomorrow. Let me know if you like it, if it's really cool, if you know, if, if you enjoy it, or it's absolutely pants and you hate it. I want, I want your honest opinion because if loads of people say they don't like it, obviously I won't do it. But if you really like it, I'll, I'll, I will keep doing it and I'll keep on top of it. So you have like, you know, plenty of backing tracks from this channel to go on with. It'll probably turn into like something like... If I do... I do videos Monday, Wednesday and Friday. And I each of them has a backing, an intro jam. So that's done for it. So, so, so that'd be six days. I'd be doing video... Well, it'd be like you, you get like a review video... Then a backing track, review video, backing track, review video, backing track. Um, that'd be really cool. That's that's crazy. That's really cool. What do you think to that, people of YouTube? Let me know. I really, really want to know your opinion on that. Let me know what you think to that. Is it a good idea? Is it a bad idea? Let me know in the comment section below. I'm going to release this video tomorrow uh, anyway, at this point in time, just to see how it goes down. So if you're a bit sceptical, like me, because I think everything I do is terrible, um, you know, just just... Put it on tomorrow and play along with it. And I just really want you to have fun with it. I don't. It's in D minor. Go nuts. Don't worry about what anybody thinks or if it's you know whatever. Just enjoy it for what it is. It's in D minor. It's in one key. You don't have to change keys or anything like that. So uh, so yeah. 
Let me know, people of the tube, uh, if you like it. And I say, I thought if I filmed me doing it, then you can kind of see what chords I'm doing. So um, it might make a bit more sense of where I am, if that makes any sense. And also, you can watch me for certain cues as well. When it goes quiet, you can see when it, it's about to come back up because I'm about to turn the drum machine back on. Um, and also, you can kind of see the intensity of like you know how I'm strumming and, and when I'm changing chords and stuff. It might help you out a bit instead of just kind of putting a picture up, which I don't like the idea of because you're not really interacting with that person. If you can see them and what they're doing, you really, you know, I'm basically like, you're interacting with what I'm doing. Like I say, I'm your rhythm guitarist, you're the lead guitarist, get to the front of the stage and solo your heart out. You know, that, that's basically what I want you to do. I'm just going to stand at the back and I'm just going to play chords for you. So, uh, so yeah, let me know what you think about People of Tube and I will see you again very soon for another video. Uh, Friday, I have a glorious Oswald telly to show you on Friday before it goes home. I'm going to miss it, but it's gorgeous and it's that double bound one. It just makes you feel ill looking at it because it's so gorgeous. Anyway, <laughs> I will see you again, well, tomorrow for a backing track and I will see you again on Friday for another video. Uh, and uh, yeah, have a great morning, afternoon, good evening. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope I answered your questions okay. I did waffle a lot and there was a few things said that I was like, why did I say that? But that's usually what happens. That's what happens when you're an idiot like me. Uh. What was that? Anyway, shut up, Dave. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching, everybody. Have a great morning, afternoon, evening. Goodbye now. Thank you very much for watching. Goodbye. How many times do I say goodbye? Goodbye. 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 Ah! This is not a comfy seat.